right. Hello, everybody. Sorry we're a little late. I had some technical difficulties. I'm here with Charlie Pobley. Um, most people know him. He's been around for a while, 45 years <laughs> at least. For a while. I've known him for 30 years. He was our first and only consultant when I was working at LAT when I first moved to Georgia. Um, Charlie can tell you more about himself in a minute, but uh, basically today we're going to go over uh, simulated process uh, using the Rutland Inks. So, uh, Charlie, uh, welcome, and uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, okay, so I got into this industry in July of 76 um, doing bootleg rock and roll shirts. And so back in those days, um, if you were doing rock and roll, it was going on a black shirt, and it was before the day of the flash unit. And so we had to really develop techniques and procedures that would allow us to get the vibrant colors that we needed and also the images that we needed. Um, and I guess I was one of those guys who came up with techniques and procedures that work. Uh, when I went to my first um, trade show, which was the SPA show in 1977 in Anaheim, um, I met a guy by the name of Jerry Gorday, and I showed him some of my shirts, and he went and spoke to some of the other guys, Duke Dalton, and I forget who else, but I think Jeff Gittimer was one of them at that time. But in any event, uh, he had mentioned to them that there's this guy who can do five and six colors on a black shirt, and <laughs> the response was, that's impossible. Well, I had shirts with me, so I pulled them out, and uh, that's actually how I got involved with speaking. So... Uh, and and actually into consulting to some extent because of the fact that we were able to figure out how to do the things that others weren't able to do. But in any event, black shirts and, and certainly multicolor printing on uh, dark colors has always been my specialty, and I still love doing it. Today's world is a very different situation. Uh, procedures are quite different. But some of what I want to go through in this presentation actually does – drift back to some of the old days. And at the end, I do have a bunch of shirts that I've had to take pictures of. Uh, they're in a book. By, it's a guy's collection. And he obviously went to a lot of concerts and we sold throughout the country. Um, he owns a lot of my shirts. So I just put, pulled, a, pulled a handful of them, which uh, I'll show just to um, get, get you to understand what went into those and how big they were and, and why they are the way they are. And a lot of that has to do with the presentation I'm going to do now. Okay. Well, I'll bring it up. Uh, we were tell, I'm going to tell on ourselves a little bit. We were, um, we were just kind of nostalgic about uh, how we used to have to do things. <laughs> so we'll probably do that at another time. We'll talk about that on your show. Well, and that's true, and my and I will post when you'll be on and all that. It's uh, the week, the Tuesday after Election Day, oh, and nice. it'll be at eleven o'clock Mountain Time, which will be one o'clock Eastern Time, and uh, we can definitely talk about some of the quote unquote the old days and what we had to do because you're an artist and so was I, um, and and things were quite different in any event. Uh, this seminar or, or this presentation is on simulated process uh, screen printing. And um, what I want to do is kind of go through all the things that are necessary in order to design, separate, and print uh, any on any color garment with Plastisol ink. If you, if you want to go to the next slide. Um, so I've been doing this in 76. And... Um, Obviously, over the years, things have changed. But uh, that being said, some things do not change. So um, let's move on. Uh, so the type of printing that we're going to talk about is raster images, which are done in Photoshop today. Um, or at least they're put together in Photoshop. The separations may not be. But it'll be quite different than what you would necessarily do in Illustrator. Illustrator, you're dealing with a big flat surface and uh, even if you have half tones you're laying in the half tones where in a raster image you're creating half tones based on tonal value so uh what we want to do is we want to talk about uh the garment itself so or the design itself 
One of the things about going on dark colored shirts, people go on dark colored shirts, especially black, because they want to make a statement. So one of the things you want to do is design large. And when I say large, as big as your palette can handle, that's as how large you want to go. Um, the things to keep in mind, you want to be able to identify the subject matter very simply. Uh, you want big, bold, strong colors. Uh, you want the image to be visible from a distance. And even in, and certainly when we were doing rock and roll shirts, uh, because they were being sold in parking lots and, in, and, uh, and at night, we would always check to see that our designs held up well under low light conditions. If they didn't, we knew they wouldn't sell. Well, I'm going to interject here because I used to be lot many plants I was at. I was over the art department and the screen department, it, over the production department. And one of the things I always said is, you know, we're making this art, but in the end of the day, we're making a T-shirt. So those two things, easy to identify your subject matter and easy to identify subject from a distance is very important. Sometimes artists get a get a little bit too crazy. They want something to be a nice piece of art. It's a, we're trying to deliver a message here or create a, a feeling. Don't don't overdo your artwork to where it actually looks like a misprint. You know, I, I've seen that many I times. I agree. You know, one of the funny things that um, I came across, I did a seminar years ago where I had about 20 people from uh, that were doing the artwork for Harley Davidson. And the reason it took my seminar, I looked at one of their shirts and it was kind of an interesting shirt. It was a guy standing next to a stream who was fishing. His bike was next to him, trees in the background. Nothing stood out. And the problem with the shirt was, was it a tree hugger shirt? Was it a fishing shirt? Was it a biker shirt? And in the end, it was nothing. It was just an image. And it really made no impact. And that was one of the things about uh, dealing with all the guys from Harley or all the people from Harley was you need to get big and bold and make it very obvious what you're trying to convey. And if it's a biker shirt, then it should focus on the bike. If it's a fishing shirt, it should focus on the guy fishing. And I think the same thing holds true with anything that you're doing for anyone. If it's a shirt for a gardening company, you have to make it very obvious that it's a gardening company, not some nice, pretty little design that sits on the left chest and, uh, and reads nicely. The back of that shirt should be big and bold and easy to, to see what's going on. Well, I'm going to tell you, too, my last job in the... Uh... <laughs> In the screen print shop, we did a lot of retail, and it, it always came down to the best sellers were the simplest designs and the cleanest designs. It didn't matter, you know. We we would get some fantastic artwork. I look, you know, I loved it. I mean, I could show it off and not sell any of those shirts. <laughs> and I turn around and do exactly. and clean, bright colors. It would sell every time. So when you're talking about wanting to make money, especially in retail or or you know, theme park stuff. You want to make it clean and, and, and recognizable. Yeah. I, you know, the old saying, you got to keep your eye on the prize. The prize is getting those shirts sold, not the artwork is at one of the conveyors in any event. So designing on a black shirt, uh, what we used to do is we would design on illustration board, black illustration board. So one of the big mistakes that people make, is they'll design on their monitor, but they'll design it on a white background. If you're going to do a black shirt, flip your monitor so you have a black background and put your image on that and work it. You want the background uh, of your monitor to act as though it were the shirt itself. And this way you're not having to put in shadows, you're not having to actually add black, you are adding the highlight and the midtone. the shadow is already there. So, um, makes it a much easier situation to deal with and you can actually decide whether or not the design is working. Your design needs to work with the shirt, not on the shirt. So if you go to the next slide, I don't know if you can hear that. That's my dog upstairs, sorry about that. Um, in any event, um, this is way one of the ways that we would illustrate. So we would do the illustration using uh, a product called Cray Pods, which is an oil-based pastel. We would illustrate our piece using the number of colors that we were going to print with. So in this particular case, it's a seven-color job. So it's white, 
uh, yellow, orange, red, etc. Uh, there's a purple in there. When we would do this type of work, we would always go from darkest, when we printed, we'd go from darkest color to lightest color. And we would always have color on top of color on top of color to create secondary and tertiary colors. So this was the illustration that we uh, put together. We'd stick our registration marks on. We would then take it to camera and shoot that and um, start to do our actual separations. If we go to the next slide, you'll see the finished image. So uh, we added the target in the background, et cetera. So when you look at the finished image and you look at the illustration, not very far removed, a little bit smoother because of the ink going down. And that was one of the things that we always loved. We, we never knew if we were going to get some greens or some other secondary oranges, et cetera. Um, this was my logo when I owned a supply house. And so uh, that was the purpose of it. In any event, moving on. So if you're a manual printer, you want to work with about a 45 line half tone. If you're on an automatic, you'd like to have uh, a 60, 45 to 65 line half tone. You could go finer. The question is, why would you want to? The, the higher you go, the greater the degree of difficulty. And unless you're looking to win awards, there's no real reason to go beyond that. As a matter of fact, Andy Anderson won tons of awards using 65 line half tones. I always work with an elliptical dot because there's more surface, it's easier to hold on screen, and you don't have as much dot gain, although the, the amount is minute anyway. Um, I've been using a 61 degree angle for, my, for everything that I do, whether it's four color process, simulated process, every color gets that same angle. 61 degrees works well for me. I know if you have Accurate, you're going to be on a 22 and a half degree angle. You can keep that. It works extremely well also. But if you decide to change, 61 is where I am. Moving on to the output devices. I don't know how many people are still using thermal. I know when I work with SGIA at their headquarters, they still have a thermal output, which gives you a beautiful dot. Most of you are going to be working with inkjet, which means you have to have RIP software so that you're computer can tell your printer how to output the proper amount of dots or the type of dot and also the correct amount of ink onto the film. Uh, more and more people are moving to direct to screen. I think it's a great way to go. Uh, there's certainly output devices that start fairly low and then go up. Uh, I think it's, um, I forget the name of the company, uh, Exile that puts out a direct to screen system for a smaller company at about $15,000. And then from there you can go up depending on how many screens a day you do. Well, I'm a big fan of the direct to screen only more about production, you know, getting the uh, uh, registration systems to work a little bit quicker on press. I agree. Uh, not only that, you don't have film to file. You don't have film to recover. You don't have film to touch up. And that's one of the questions that I get from uh, companies that I put together in their inkjet film. It's like, how do you, what's the best way to file it? And my answer is in the trash. Yes. It's a dollar a sheet. Don't yeah. get yourself bent out of shape of, of taking this three color job that you've got $3 worth of film in. Now you're going to try and find a way of filing it. You're going to try and find a way of recovering it. Uh, if it gets scratched, you have to redo it anyway. The easiest thing to do is save it for about a week, and at the end of the week, toss it. Yes. You need to rerun the job, print it out again. It's a buck a sheet. Don't get yourself all bent out of shape about that. I think early on, a lot of people had problems. Uh, their their file integrity, when they were saving it, sometimes they would make a small adjustment and not save that last file. That's where a lot of things yep. happen. That's why they got so afraid of doing that. But uh you know, just take care of your file when you're finished. You got a final product, uh, file it and uh, save it as is. It's, uh, you know, that that's the best way to come back to it. I totally agree. You know, um, back in the day when I first started, we had to keep our film because we didn't have anything else. And I mean, we would take up an entire wall of nothing but film. Trying to find a piece could take an hour or so. Um, I think, you know, you have to look at what is your time worth versus that piece of film. And certainly in direct-to-screen, 
um, you eliminate all of those situations. You output as you need. You go directly to your screen, and the consistency is that much greater. Moving on. So there are several types of frames. Certainly when I started, uh, I used wooden frames. The difference was everybody used wooden frames. Uh, today, a lot of companies are using rigid metal frames. Uh, are they good? They're okay. Uh, the biggest problem is you have no ability to adjust your tension. It's whatever comes in is where you are, and from there it's going to go down. I was always a fan of Newman roller frames, to be honest with you. The biggest issue with them is people will buy them and not do the maintenance on them. And so uh, you find many of them on the market being sold as used frames now because uh, they've gone back over to to a rigid frame. My favorite frame at the moment is a semi-retention frame. It's the Sherlock Easy Frame. And the reason I love it, it's a one-stretch deal. It takes you to a, an extremely high tension. I'm always a fan of being in the 30 Newton range, 30 to 35. Uh, if I'm working with their screen and I'm on a 156 mesh, if I measure it, I'm usually in the low 40s, which means when that mesh relaxes, it'll be in the mid 30s which is perfect. So to me, I think that that's one of the advantages of it. The other thing is it's a squared out frame versus round rollers. So uh, makes it a little bit easier on press, but not, not that big a deal. Rigid frames, can you get great work? You can get some really good work out of them. Problem is people try and keep their screens for way too long. They get little holes in them. They try and patch them. You know, it's part of what we need. You need to have great equipment in order to do great work. Your screen is definitely one of the major pieces, and it's probably the least expensive part of the whole operation in terms of uh, adjusting your quality and your speed and productivity. Yeah, personally, at our app lab, we've been moving over to the easy frames, uh, mainly for purposes. We have, we go through so many jobs a day, uh, testing and doing customer complaint, uh, you know, customer requests and things like that, that, uh, we've got to get up and down. And so that's the square frame is so much better for that. Um, I agree. We do hang on to some of the other frames only so we can, you know, simulate what a customer is going through, uh, right. if we're having a complaint so we can show them the difference in prints between the two frames. So I totally agree with that. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. When you take a rigid frame and then you take a high-tension screen uh, and you print the same job, the initial print looks pretty much the same. About 100 prints into it, it doesn't look the same at all. Yes. <laughs> and, and you know, trying to uh, get someone to understand that is very difficult because they'd have to run the same job side by side in order to see the difference. But um, moving on. So, um, um, if, if I'm going on fleece, I would use a, a 110 mesh. Or, and again, some of these, um, I actually push the limit, but this is my general rundown. I use a 110 for fleece. I use a 156 as an underlay for T-shirts. And I use 230 on top of everything. Uh, and all my screens would be at 35 Newtons. What I've been doing lately, though, especially on automatics, is I'm going 230 on the underlay and 230 and 305s on the top colors. Um, the inks today are just so wonderful that you can get great vibrancy and a soft hand by pushing up on the mesh count. Um, haven't played much with fleece, but I would certainly go to a 156 on fleece. I think the biggest thing is your squeegee selection, which is the next slide, uh, or no. So you have several different kinds of ink. There's transparent, there's opaque, there's fluorescence. I'm a fan of only going with fluorescent color, uh, I'm sorry, with opaque color matching systems. Uh, to me, I can take an opaque color and I can cut it and make it more transparent, but I can't take a transparent ink and make it more opaque to any great extent. I hate fluorescence, to be honest with you. So when they're in, they're in and you got to use them. But boy, I wish they would keep away from those. They are sticky. You need to flash right after them. Uh, they do create problems. And in, in today's world, phthalate-free inks are the only kind of inks that you pretty much see anyway, so that doesn't matter. I've, I've been working with the Rutland M2 and M3 systems probably for 
who was since the early 80s. And um, to me, for doing simulated process, I think that's still the best system on the market. Um, we can get into some more on that, but uh, it's a system that I work with for, for a couple of reasons, but one of them really is I use Separation Studio for separations, and the M3 system, if you're using uh, their white, their black, their yellow, their marine, um, their scarlet, pretty much matches almost identically to the Separation Studio colors. And I, this way I don't have to mix any um, Pantone colors, which I think is a great way to, something great to avoid. That's interesting, yeah. Squeegees, I love squeegees. I think that most people don't understand enough about them, especially uh, when you buy your automatic, they come with junk squeegees and you know i'll go into a shop and a year later they still have the same squeegees on they've never sharpened them or anything else and they don't own any others which is stupid but nevertheless um for my underlay i use a triple durometer 55 90 55 which is put out by serilor uh if you're doing uh and my colors would all be 65 durometer or 65 90 65 on an automatic on a manual the reason i go with a 65 straight is uh, the triple durometers cost twice as much as a single durometer and on a manual press, you wouldn't know the difference. On an automatic, you definitely would. And so uh, I still love my 5590-55 for my underlay and the 6590-65, although I've, I've definitely moved over to uh, the uh, double blade squeegee, which is the next slide. So. Double blade squeegee comes with a 5590-55 up front, backed up with a 6290-62. One stroke of a double blade, when done correctly, is a better lay down than a double stroke using a single uh, blade squeegee. Uh, even though it prints slowly, it appears to be slow. It's actually about 30% faster than a double stroke. Uh, I'm a big fan of using a roller squeegee to flatten the uh, print after the flash of my underlay only because it gives you a beautiful surface to work on. And I've played with the uh, hot iron or the hot heads a bit. Actually, what I found is if I use a uh, white underlay with a double blade squeegee, flash it, use a roller squeegee, print everything else, and then finish with a hot head after the last print, you get some amazing looking stuff out of it. Right, it's a nice, really nice feel and uh, very good drape on the garment. Yep. You get crisp, vibrant, soft looking, uh, a soft feeling print, which I think is ultimately what everyone is wanting anyway. Right. Of course, the hot head and the roller squeegees definitely have a different price point. I think uh, roller squeegees are 300 and some odd dollars and hot heads, I believe, are about $3,000. Yeah, but, you know, many, many printers will use that, you know, a plancha, a, a, a smoothing screen after a flash. Yeah, oh, I agree. Hot. Listen, I, was, I agree. I was always a fan of if it's something that's going to improve my productivity and my quality, I'm buying it. Right. And uh, whatever that cost is, I'll make that up very quickly with productivity and quality. And I, I don't think you can go wrong with that. Uh, moving on, flood bar types. You know, to me, I mean, I know there are a variety of them. I do have some of the Newman flood bars here. Um, they were great to play with. Uh, they definitely do a great job. But in general, I never see them in a shop anymore. Um, I don't see standard flood bars being used that often. Mostly everyone has moved over to the wingtip flood bars, which makes the most sense. I actually came out with a product that I think Action Engineering is going to uh, – produced called the wall, which um, sits on either side of the uh, flood bar, uh, maybe a, a quarter uh, to of an inch on either side so that the ink um, doesn't flow out to the side, especially if you're dealing with water base. But it would um, transfer back into the usable area so you wouldn't have to stop as often to add more ink or to move the ink around. But that's a different story. In any event, Wing, fl uh, wing flood bars, to me, make a whole lot of sense. I agree. And I also uh, like, uh, especially on water base and very thin plastisol like process, I like using the um, the traps, the ink traps on my squeegees. 
and it'll actually pull the ink back into the image as it's printing. So it's it's a it's a nice uh, nice tool to have. Yeah, now, I'll send you. you <laughs> I'll send you a video of my wall. Uh, oh yeah. I did some testing on it. I think you'll find it to be interesting. Yeah, I'd like to see that. In any event, uh, just to go through the summary, uh, design big, strong colors, color on color. Definitely get some uh, secondary and tertiary colors. Um, when you're designing, make sure that you have a single point light aiming at that central figure so that you create great contrast. And by doing that, you'll make your image jump. You want to work with a high tension screen, fine mesh, definitely sharp, straight squeegees. If you don't own a squeegee sharpener and you have an automatic, you're making a huge mistake. You should be changing you should be sharpening those blades about every 10,000 prints, which sounds like a lot, but if you're doing 2,000 shirts a day, that means you should be sharpening your blades at the end of the week. Um, when you're doing simulated process, it's white flash, and then everything else goes wet on wet. Let me take you through a couple of shirts. So this one was one uh, that I did back in the early 90s. I think the date on it is 93 or 94. Uh, this was with Nutmeg Mills, and this was their first try. I used to make uh, companies actually do their initial work all by hand, even though they had computers. I think you learn a lot when you're illustrating by hand and you're doing your work, and you can see it's kind of color on color. This was actually the very first piece, and they actually were selling the shirt. That's why it has all of the information on it. Uh, of course, Charlotte Hornets don't exist anymore. But uh, that was shirt one. About three months later, if you go to the next one, this was done by the same company, same people. Uh, this is an 11 color print. It's white flash, 10 colors wet on wet, um, including a metallic gold on there. And uh, this is definitely um, more of what I was looking for. If you notice, it has um, black shadows. It has color on color. It has a single point light source with false lighting on the opposite end so that the image doesn't fall away into the abyss. And if we go to the next one, so after about a year and a half, two years of working with black shirts, uh, of course the sales department now wants to go back to colored shirts. So this is a design that was done for a black shirt. And the reason you can tell that if you look under the, uh, uh, at the chest and under the uh, neck and stuff, it's black. It's the black of the shirt, although we printed that black, where if this was on a black shirt, we wouldn't have to print black at all. But you can see the color coming in, uh, the light coming in from one side, the false light on the other side. Um, to me, this is an ideal situation of getting a uh, image onto a shirt and making it dynamic. And let's see if we move on. So I, I do a lot of work with uh, Dane Clement, and uh, we were doing the FESPA show back in 2005 in, uh, in Munich. And so the, uh, the logo or, or the city mascot for Munich, Germany, is a, a lion. And so that's where this came in. Um, again, a lot of the same issues. Color, uh, strong lighting on one side, black shadows on the other side. Don't lose focus about what the image is. Uh, I think this was probably about a six or seven color job. I don't remember exactly. But what I want to do is take you through a step by step on a couple of jobs. So if we go to the next slide. So this is a, um, this is my white underlay. This is on a 156 mesh, um, 45 line half tone, 61 degree angle, elliptical dot. It's white, and we flash it, and then we go to our scarlet, which is printed wet, following followed with a gold or yellow, and then uh, finishing up with a highlight white. Nice. And so um, it's four colors, not four color process. It's just four simulated process colors. Uh, they're all opaque, and um, we get the, the image to jump. What I want to do is take you through the next one because there's a lot more involved in it. So the next one is our Viking. Um, 
if you follow the little triangles on the bottom, you'll see how the colors sitting on top of the white and colors sitting on top of the black vary. But uh, one of the things about doing a really good black shirt design or dark color shirt design is your underlay should look like a really good one color job. It may not be as vibrant because the purpose of the underlay is to seal the shirt off from the colors going on it. If it were just a one color job, we would definitely have hit this probably a second time and left it alone or hit it once with a double squeegee, which gives you sharper detail. And could I live with this as a one color job? I absolutely could. So That's always a great we, sign of a great underbase is, you know, I, do you see everything in the design with the underbase? Yep. And, and that definitely is, to me, that is the key to a, a really wonderful shirt. You'll know right after that first print whether the shirt is going to work out or not, or the design's going to work out. If that underlay doesn't sing to you, then it's gone. Anyway, we print the white flash, and we'll go on uh, with the scarlet. Then we'll move on to our gold. And you can see on the, on the bottom how those colors um, look on the black part of the shirt and on the white part of the design. Uh, so we then basically a white underbase with four colors, but in essence, it's a white underbase with eight colors because you're yeah, exactly because you're getting uh, you're allowing some of it to fall off the white and some of it to stay on it, and so you're getting different tonal values. We then add our blue or our turquoise actually because Vikings have to have turquoise eyes. Um, followed with gray. Normally, I wouldn't print gray. I don't know why we did in this. I think the gray only hit into the horns on the uh, helmet. Quite honestly, I could have lived without that, but nevertheless, there they are. And um, we finish up with a highlight white, which should make everything jump. Um, here's the thing about that particular design. It's interesting. When you look at it, it looks very good. Being anatomically correct is something I don't concern myself with. You would never have shadows under the cheeks and under the nose and under the eyebrows that are black. Uh, the only way you would get that is actually by cutting them and under the mustache and stuff. I like to use a lot of black to create contrast. And that's what this image has is a huge amount of contrast that is not realistic in terms of photographically being correct but or anatomically correct. But we are dealing with a T-shirt. We're not trying to sell a photo. And so we want things to jump, and we want them to be exaggerated, and that's what this does. Moving on, we're now into um, – so this is a 1979 design of King Tut that was done for the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And this is the first print coming off of it. And, of course, it's a bit on the dull side. Um, this is a five color print, wet on wet, uh, white prints last, not first. And uh, the thing about the first print is it always looks dull. The next one is 10 strokes later or 10 shirts later. And obviously this jumps off the page now. And the reason it does is as you build up uh, ink on the bottom of the screen, it stops pulling it off the shirt. So your first shirt will always be on the dull side, four or five shirts into it, you'll see what your production run should really look like. So I'm a fan of set it up, check your registration, then run one print with about four or five strokes per color, and now you're ready for your production run. What I want to show on the next couple of shirts, these are all part of my, quote, unquote, my rock and roll shirts. Uh, this one was done on, back in 77 when I didn't have an automatic or anything, this was done on a print table. So if you look at the type on top, you'll notice that it's probably a quarter of an inch or so out of register. You know, when you deal with rock and roll, there's a couple of nice things. Number one, we never got returns because they never knew who we, who we were. <laughs> um, so, you know, uh, worried about really uh, curing shirts. Yeah, it wasn't much of a uh, issue. In any event, this is from a guy's collection. Um, I, I don't own any of these anymore. I wish I did. But look at the size of the image. It's huge. Um, these were all printed wet on wet. White always finished last. And so one of the things we learned very quickly was 
if you have white hitting around things, it makes it jump. Right. Um, Led Zeppelin was always one of the big groups. So uh, we would always spend a lot of time and we did always go in with group faces. And the reason we did is that sold. We never worried about what the inside uh, or the legitimate shirt was like. We were only concerned about what we could do and what we had to do in the uh, parking lots. The next shirt is one of my favorites. I'm a big Dylan fan. And um, to me, you know, when you look at the width of this and the height of the design, I mean, it's massive. Um, to me, this is the type of thing that we did all the time. One of the things about this artwork, we had to do this with using a camera, uh, using ruby lith and uh, press type at times, and also a lot of hand stippling, which you can see very easily on this. A design like this would take about 40, 40 hours to do. Wow. And that was fairly typical at that time. You know, in today's world, if I was, if I, outside of having to design the piece, which definitely would take some time, separations on this would be a bing bang and done. Right. Yeah, I remember those days. Believe me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this this one actually is one of my all time favorites. I loved this shirt. Um, if you notice how the white goes around the, everything in this image, it makes the whole thing jump. And um, we always use the same colors. It was always blue, green, purple, orange, yellow, white. Uh, we never used red. Red back in those in the 70s was a horrible color. It had no life to it, so we would always use orange. In any event, um, that white outline is something that we kind of tagged into, and we never let go of it. We always stayed along with that. Yeah, it's very effective. Next shirt, uh, obviously with all of the uh, stuff going on about Queen, look at the width of the shirt. You can't even see the, uh, the, the left to the right side because it wraps around the shirt. But again, uh, gaudy as hell. I totally agree with that. Easy to see at night, big and bold, had the group faces on there. And uh, this is the type of stuff that just sold like crazy. You know, um, was the quality of the print wonderful? For its day it was in today's world, it would be considered a terrible print. <laughs> and I would go along with that. But uh, you have to realize this is like 1980, 1981. And, and, uh, the, and the face wow. details are made up entirely of the white with the black showing through in the shirt. Yeah, uh, and we always allowed black to come through. Yeah. The next one, one of my favorites, this is a, uh, The Who. And um, obviously, same situation, lots of white images of the uh, group. You can see how the type on the bottom is a little blurry and stuff. We never worried about that. It's the type on top that really made it and the images of the uh, band that really made it, everything stand out. The next shirt is kind of an interesting one. As you can tell, sometimes um, they didn't hold up well in a wash. Uh, this is a guy's shirt. Uh, you know, this belongs to somebody. And uh, you can definitely see that we were undercured. Um, that didn't didn't really affect us. We still sold the shirt. He still owns the shirt. I just hope he didn't uh, wash it too many more times. He'd probably have a blank shirt. Uh, hey, I know. Hey, the that's, very, why, that's why in huh? the late nineties we had the dis, we had the uh, distressed look. <laughs> very much so. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's funny. The very first shirt I designed was for the Wings concert in 1976. I was going to Madison Square Garden, and it was done with text dyes. We didn't print it. It was uh, contracted off. And I think I may still have a shirt. It didn't survive the first wash. What I, what I got after the first wash was kind of a stain of the colors that were on there. Yeah. In any event, uh, in today's world, we are definitely well ahead. But these are shirts that were... Um, cutting edge back in its day. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you're thinking, really? And the answer was, yeah, try and do a six-color design on a black shirt with no flash, and you'll see what I mean. I do have the film for that King Tut. I'm going to run it uh, if there's ever another trade show uh, at the trade show so that um, 
you can get a feel for what it's like to print five and six colors on a black shirt without flashing. <laughs> Any event, for those who uh, want to get in touch with me, um, this is my contact information. And um, I also now have Zoom. So if somebody wants to uh, work with me or show me whatever they go on, you know, whatever they want to uh, talk about or show me, I'm game. You, we can Zoom it together. Uh, just contact me. Um, and uh, we can set up a, uh, a Zoom session. And I do have a new website. If you uh, go to my website, uh, I do want some feedback on it. I would love to hear what people have to say about it. We have anyway, a, one or two we have some questions. Here, let's see here. Um, now I got to go back and find it. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, you go ahead. And I can find the, the absolute minimum tension we should aim for. Minimum tension to me, I think anything below thirty newtons is uh, you're you're hurting yourself. Yeah. Um, and you're talking you know, about simulated you, process here, aren't you? Right. right. And and we're talking about mesh counts that are from two thirty down. At three oh five, I'm in the low twenties, mm -hmm. but you're talking about a thirty four micron screen at that point. So to me, I love being in the 30 to 35 Newton range for everything. And certainly on, on uh, I mean, years ago, I did some, I, I made a bet with someone that I could take a particular mesh count and bring it up to 100 Newtons. And uh, I did win the bet, which just about killed me. But um, in today's world, getting to 30, 35 Newtons, you do need to have some kind of retentionable screen. And easy frames to me are a great way to go. John yeah. just commenting the easy frames work great with most reg systems. With all yeah, of them, actually. Like a lot of uh, just comments in here, uh, all agreeing with us. <laughs> Thank God. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so what we'll do is, you know, we'll keep monitoring this uh, after we close down. Keep running, bringing the comments in. If you have a question, go ahead and answer it. We'll be monitoring it uh, for weeks, probably. <laughs> um, so, um, I, and, and certainly, I. Somebody wants to email me, text me, um, whatever. I'm definitely game to help out. Fantastic. We we appreciate your time, Charlie. Thanks for, you know, coming on with us, and uh, uh, thanks for all the great information. Oh, it's my pleasure, and I I definitely love doing this type of stuff. I hope that uh, hope to see you on my show oh, yeah. uh, the week after um, election day, okay. and it'll be at eleven o'clock Mountain Time, one o'clock Eastern Time. And um, we can chat about the old days if we want to uh, get into that or some of the old techniques. In any event, Ray, thanks so much for having me on. Great. We'll call it these kids these days. Anyway. All right. We'll see. You. Thank you, Have Charlie. Bye All now. Right. Bye.